Hello and welcome to That's Wow. I'm Xiaoyun, a nature guide and environmental educator, and I'll be your host for this podcast series. We'll be talking to a variety of special guests about some wild and wonderful topics surrounding nature conservation in Singapore, our city in nature. That's Wow is brought to you by the National Parks Board. If you like our content, don't forget to show your support by hitting that follow button and giving us a five-star rating. So today we have Dylan and Movin here with us to talk about birds, the unique and varied sounds that they make, and how we're conserving them here in Singapore. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Hey, thanks for having us. Hello, hello. My name is Movin. I'm basically a PhD student at NUS. I work a lot on bird genetics, mainly in the region. I'm interested in conservation and I guess I'm also the vice president of the Bird Society of Singapore and also on the podcast Climate She's King. Yes. Mm. Hi, I'm Dylan. Uh, I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Park Spot and I mainly work on environmental impact assessments, consultations for develop developments, and also uh, other conservation-related research. Uh, yeah, and my hobby is bird watching. So before we begin, can the audience, can you recognize this bird call? I'm sure you guys are really familiar with keeping you guys up in the early mornings. It's an Asian quail. So we've just heard a really familiar call. Um, let's talk a bit about why do birds have bird songs and bird calls? So I think bird vocalizations are broadly separated into uh, songs and calls. So they're distinguished by their functions. Uh. So what we know as uh, songs are generally longer, more complex. It's what you will consider melodious. So it's associated with mating functions such as uh, trying to attract your mates or territorial displays. Uh. Although some of the songs can be uh, kind of simple as well. So it's like, for example, the large-tailed ninja. So it just gives that chong 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 call. Yeah, so that's the song of the night, large tailed night job, but it's considered simple compared to a passerina or songbird. Yeah, and, and calls are basically much simpler. So so calls are things that you hear single notes oftentimes, and they're used for different functions. But some birds can be very small, the bush can be very thick, so they can lose sight of each other. So what happens is they have these things called contact calls. Each bird in the group just be making the call all the time so that like everyone kind of knows that they're all together in the same vicinity. So that's what happens when they want to like flock together. So typically like some birds, like some, like I don't know, tailor birds, babblers, warblers, things like that. Like the small birds that tend to like look in vegetation for their food. So these are insect eating birds like typically, right? So they, they wander around inside the vegetation. They're small birds. They can easily disappear from each other's line of sight. Mm. So contact calls are one of the ways that they sort of stay in touch and ensure that no one wanders off too far. Because if you lose sight of each other, it's easy to just be like distracted by especially tasty looking worm or something and just get you know, wander off. So contact calls make sure that the flock stays tight and close to each other. Other types of calls could be, for instance, like some bird species, they leave their young to go hunting or they go fishing and then they come back and they listen to the, the call of the, the youngs and each of the moms can recognize the, the, the young's call, right? Individual. So that would be things like uh, some of the seabirds. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's other things like uh, alarm calls as well. So mm. I think some of the birds, maybe drongos, they give off uh, alarm calls that uh, kind of alert other members of their group, whether if there's a raptor around or a predator around. So it's something to warn other members as well. Yeah, and, and one interesting thing is that a lot of birds can mimic the songs and calls of other birds. So many species do that. Like, so things like leaf birds, mm. some of your shamas, the drongo is especially famous for that, right? They actually can mimic the calls that they hear around them. And they add this up to their own song sometimes. And then female birds are attracted to mm. male birds that have much more mimicry in their repertoire, for instance, because mm. that's considered more skilled. Mm -hmm. So if it's a bird mimicking another bird's call, are you guys able to tell that apart as not a, <laughs> the original? Really depends. Yeah. Some birds are masterful mimics and some are not so masterful. Yeah, so I think there are some common birds like the drongo and Asian glossy starling. So they are really good at mimicking. I've heard this Asian glossy starling outside my window. It, it's, it, they're like a whole repertoire of calls. It's like blueing pitta, and they're like bended, bended woodpecker. And I think even drongos, I've heard them mimicking like changeable hawk eagle as well. But So I think sometimes you can... The mimic is really accurate, but I think how, how you can tell is they, sometimes they do a whole series of different mm. calls, so you can kind of tell, like, it uh, wouldn't be a single bird that's making all these calls and songs. Huh? Yeah. yeah, and drongos have this metallic sort of tone to their, to their call all the time. It's very clangy, it's very, it's very brassy, I think, I think, I find. La. So, like, usually, like, you'd be like, that's, it's a bit uncanny valley with the, <laughs> mm. with the song, and you're like, it sounds a bit off, it sounds a bit yeah. metallic, then you're like, maybe it's a drongo. 
and what are some of the other methods that you can use to identify birds? So I think um, typically, I mean, it's in the name, right? Bird watching. So like, first of all, IDing birds based on, on what you see. So things like the bill shape, the overall size of the bird, the color, what it's doing, the behavior it's exhibiting. Those are all things that you can sort of use to sort of like get a sense of like what species you might be looking at. Um, at the same time, calls are also helpful. I mean, many, many, some birds do mimic other birds, right? But by and large, every bird has its own sound or many birds have their own sounds and they are diagnostic, meaning that um, if I listen to it, I will be able to tell you what species it is. Yeah. So I think I find field guides very useful uh, for me. I think uh, looking at the plates, looking at the descriptions of the features of the birds really help you to kind of understand better when you see the bird in the field and then you compare it to what you see in the field guide. So I think these are some of the things you can rely on. Yeah, and, and things like, you know, like online resources. I mean, like we have our whole like website up with all of the birds in, in Singapore, recorded in Singapore so far. So that's definitely something you can do. Um, being out on the field regularly and using binoculars regularly and sort of like keep doing, it's like a muscle, right? Like you just keep practicing your bird identification and you'll get really good at it. Mm. And if there's anything you, you can't identify in the field, like you can just take a photo and can post it online or ask a couple of friends. I think uh, the community is really welcoming and helpful. So perhaps like for our listeners, you can like introduce or recommend some very nice places for bird watching and what are the common birds that you can see in those places? Yeah, so I think Singapore Botanic Gardens is one of my favorite places to bird at. Uh, I think you really get a great range of species there. You can get uh, some of the more common widespread species you can spot in gardens, as well as some of the more forest dependent species like your drongos or your hill miners. And some of the birds that are common and that you might hear there uh, are species like the collet kingfisher and also the blue crowned hanging parrot. So I think these are some of the quite common species. So like, for instance, the herring parrot, you often hear it like this, this cheap, cheap, cheap call, as you may have heard earlier, and you just spot it flying through the air. Yeah, yeah like, like a green bullet. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's really interesting to spot and hear them flying around the gardens. Yeah, I mean, I really like the botanic gardens also um, because you get some forest dependent stuff like hill miner, for instance, which mm. typically in the region you would only see in decent forests. But in Singapore, it's one of the few places in the world where you sort of like, We've integrated greenness into our cityscape to an extent that we're even getting like high canopy forest species or forest-ish species um, sort of getting here. Like in Ulu Pandan Park Connector, which is really far away from any patch of forest, you still get hill miner, you know? So that's that's pretty interesting. Um, other places that I think people can go birding that's easily accessible, Bishan Mukyo Park. Mm. Any neighborhood park actually will have a good number of birds. Like even like small neighborhood playgrounds with some vegetation nearby. Um, you know, like largest parks, Kent Ridge Park, um, even Ulu Pandan Park Connector, which I've mentioned a few times. Um, these are all like, they're very thin strips of land, but like you get really good birds there, right? Like there's a lot of greenery and there's a lot of like mature vegetation in some of these areas as well. So you get some interesting species every so often. Oh, and, and, and the other one would be Jurong Lake Gardens. I think that, yeah, that, I think that's that one deserves a special yeah, shout yeah, out. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, and, and Tampanese Eco Green, I guess, is also pretty good. In the east. Yeah. Well, yeah. In the east, yeah. Yeah, and recently, uh, more recently, because I live in Woodland, so lots of the uh, Hempstead wetlands. Ah, oh, right, yeah, right, yeah, right, right, right. Yes, 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 yeah, the fishy yeah, goats. Yeah. The owls there yeah, as well. Yeah, the owls, yes. Okay, I'm going to enjoy this portion. It's like a segue into your personal experiences with birding. Like how do you initially get into birding? What sparked your interest? And actually what sustains your interest? For me, I think I've always been interested in animals. So I think when I was young, I just like look at random animals outside my house. So I think one of the first birds I saw that was interesting and not a uh, Javan minor was like an oriental magpie robin. It's just this black and white bird. I was just like, what's that hopping around the ground? So I thought that was really interesting and, try and just try to find out more about the name of the bird or what it is. Yeah, but I think what started uh, my kind of proper bird watching journey was uh, related to wildlife photography. So I bought a camera and I just started going out to photograph uh, animals uh, in Singapore. And I think birds are some of the more visible and prominent taxa and it's the, mo the most well-studied taxa and there's so many resources out there for it. So I think naturally I kind of gravitated towards that and then start going out with friends and then we just got hooked on this uh, bird watching hobby. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, my my the bird that poisoned my well was uh, Rufus-tailed tailor bird in Ubin. 
So it's actually a really small bird, but it's really, really pretty because it has a red, like a reddish brown head and a reddish brown tail. And the back is gray, gray brown, and the underparts are like this sparkling white color. And I saw it and I was like very like fascinated by it because this time it hopped onto the floor on the bridge, one of the bridges in Ubin, and it was like completely out. And I was like, wow, that is such a weird thing. What is it? And then I was very obsessed with figuring out what it was. And then that took a bit of time. And then after I figured it out, I was like, oh my God, this is very fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I was like, I guess I'm doing this for life. Okay, I didn't know that at the time, <laughs> but like, I was just like, then I would just be observing it more. I'd get in, like, be more familiar with these available resources, which I think like Dylan says for birds, right? Do you just have a lot of resources available? People have been watching birds for like mm -hmm. centuries, right? Like definitely more so than like, other groups of animals like even if even other charismatic groups like mammals for instance you do not get the same kind of identification resources that you get for birds um much less things like hops and fish right mm -hmm. so um and these are just vertebrates and vertebrates that's a okay, yeah. whole other like black hole right um but yeah in any case that was sort of the bird that saw they all snowballed from there and then we kind of just started traveling everywhere yeah so maybe um, linking to like you guys traveling, um, you can share about where has birding taken you to like maybe places or different encounters or maybe even a, a feeling or like a state of mind. Where has it taken you? Yeah, so we did about two and a half, two plus three, three-ish. Three weeks. Yeah, in, 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 in South Africa. And that was crazy. That gave us like, we saw like 400... 50 species-ish. Yeah, 400. Yeah, and 50 species. And yeah. 50, 450 yeah. species yeah. of birds. <laughs> of birds, yeah. In, 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 <laughs> Three weeks. In three yeah. weeks, yeah. So, so that was oh. quite a whirlwind. Yeah, that oh, that's, that's insane. Yeah, yeah that's I think if we had another week, we would have added another hundred. <laughs> but think anyway, twenty species a day. <laughs> yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that. Actually, it's, yeah, it's you're right. Crazy, that, yeah. that that is that is the the numbers yeah. that we're talking about. So I think we just visit a, a really wide range of different habitats. Uh, you got yeah. savannas, you got arid, your yeah, deserts, your desert, you know, the yeah. Karoo, yeah, Karoo, um, yeah. The then there's this area, in the southernmost part of South mm. Africa called mm. uh, the Cape, which is the fine bos, yes. uh, which is like this, it's this whole, it's its own vegetation type that's only biome, found yeah. in like Southern most Africa, nowhere else in the world. Yeah. And the vegetation there looks freaking alien. It's right? like, yes, yeah, it's like small plants and like succulents and it's like, yeah. it's, everything is endemic there. Yeah. And um, it's yeah. like yeah. super cool. It's and insane, yeah. because of that, it also has its own birds and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty crazy. Um, I mean, it was also a pretty good trip for mammals. Yeah, and stuff, yeah actually right? we, we got a lot of species of mammals. Yeah. <laughs> did not get the big five, but we got, pretty good like yeah. i think like close to 40 50, 50 species, species of like, mammal yeah. yeah so it's pretty yeah. cool oh wait oh wait special mention to the 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 what? the pelagic trip <laughs> no yes no yeah yes so we we also went out in the sea looking for birds because south africa um there's actually this really cold current called the benguela current that is uh, along the coast of south africa right uh, along the Western coast of South Africa. And that actually brings up a lot of marine nutrients. Mm. Mm. There's an upwelling there. And because of that, you get a lot of fish, schools, which is why it's like one of the most heavily fished areas in the world. Mm. Uh, and because of that, you also get a lot of seabirds there and yeah. come to eat the fish. So we went out on a boat to see those birds. Um, it was a rough, <laughs> it was rough. It was super choppy. Some of us good. were very seasick. I will not <laughs> Look <names>. at Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, it was not an enjoyable trip. Okay. I mean, we did see an albatross really close, yeah, so that was that. But, like, but yeah, what, at what cost? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> albatross. I I think birds are like fascinating, and the best thing is like it's available to so many people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if those trips sound amazing because of the birds. Before we continue, it's time for our fun fact segment again. In the spirit of our podcast title, That's Wild, I'd like to invite Dylan Movin to share something wild about biodiversity that you guys may not have known before. So I think uh, there's this really interesting group of uh, birds called megapodes. So I think the, the range is like kind of Australasian, then the Indonesia, Australia, and Papua, mm -hmm. New Guinea. So I think, I think they're closely related to pheasants. So it's in this the bigger group called galliforms. What's unique about them is that they kind of re they rely on external sources of heat to incubate and hatch their eggs. So they actually don't incubate the eggs themselves. Like they, don't sit, they don't sit on the nest and like use their root patch to, to, to warm the eggs. So I think what they do is they construct these massive mounds or like burrows that uh, in sand or using like uh, compost or uh, just leaves and sticks. So some of these uh, external sources of heat are sort of like geothermal heat, so I think the, the ground okay, might be warm. So. Yeah, yeah. So the ground might be warm. So they use they dig and uh, bury their eggs in sand, which might be heated, uh, and or they can use uh, compost uh, kind of mounds. So this keeps the the temperature of the kind of the mound uh, consistent, and then or they can also rely on solar heating, like just from the sun. Yeah. So it's an external sources. So they lay the eggs, then they leave it there and maintain the nest, but they don't actually interact with the egg. And the chicks, they take a long time to hatch, maybe like between like 40 to 80 days. So actually that's pretty long for a bird. 
and the the chicks come out uh, like precocious. They're they're well developed. They can survive on their own. They can run around. They can they can I think they can, they can, they can yeah, they can even start flying right after hatching. So I think that's yeah, a really cool group of birds. Uh, yeah. Some names of those that group. Like? Uh, um, Malio. Malio. So yeah, yeah. that's one of the more uh, famous, famous ones. ones. Or brush turkey yeah. in, in Australia. Or, uh, this, and others are just like variations, like Philippine megapod. Yeah, yeah or, or like or like scrub fowls. Yeah, yeah scrub, scrub fowls. fowls. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, these are yeah. some of the species they can find. When oh, the Mali fowl, right? The Mali, yeah, there's a Mali fowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, Movin, how about you? Math fact. Okay, like, so we've spoken a lot about the green broadbill, right? So the thing about birds is that they come in every color, almost, right? But if you look at the world, right, um, mammals don't come in green or blue, for instance, right? Um, and the reason is because birds, because of feathers, right, have this thing called structural coloration. And in the case of the green broadbill, um, the green in the green broadbill is not actually pigment. It's because of the micro shape of the feathers and the way it reflects light. So... Most green birds have that. And that's also precisely why the green broadbill is so green. It is the greenest green that you would have ever seen in your whole life, right? If you're looking in a patch of leaves, look, and you know that green broadbill is there, look for the greenest thing there. It's probably the green broadbill. But there's one group of birds that actually have evolved actual green pigments, which is very, very rare. And these are actually an African group of birds called the turacos. If you grind up green broadbill feathers, right, and you destroy the structural the structure is not green anymore. It's like gray right. or something. It's like gray or whatever, yeah. 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 Uh, but turacos, if you grind up their feathers, it's still green. Yeah. And this is actually interesting because it's a copper-based pigment. And so that is my fun fact. And that's very wild. <laughs> yeah, that's very wild. So maybe to bring it back home to Singapore, let's talk a bit about bird conservation here. Um, maybe you guys can give us a brief overview about what is being done in Singapore for bird conservation. Yeah, so I think there are quite a lot of different uh, initiatives and programs that MPARX does. So I think first one we have is the Species Recovery Program. So these are kind of like targeted species action plans for specific species. Uh. So for instance, the blue-throated beetle. So I think that's uh, handled by uh, Pulau Ubin team. So actually we ring some of these birds and monitor their nesting sites uh, so that we kind of get more information of their life history and how better to conserve them. Uh. And we also have uh, outreach programs, so like citizen science programs such as Garden Bird Watch, Heron Watch, where we kind of public volunteers involved as well uh, to and special parts to Sungai yeah. Bulo for Weather Watch as mm. well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is a program that they have like for six months during the migratory season to get like um, people interested in migratory shorebirds to come down and just take a look at that. Stuff. Yeah. So I think another thing we do is also uh, kind of bird ringing. So we do tracking and ringing of birds to find out more about their movements and life history traits. So I think at uh, Pulau Bin and Sungai Bulo, we do a lot of ringing for birds. And this allows us to better understand uh, just where they, where they go about. If, if you recapture a bird, you can find out a lot more information about it. Like how old is it, uh, where it's been, if it's been caught at somewhere else. So we kind of get an idea of their movements as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to give a bit more, like, let's elaborate a bit more. So, like, I think, like, you mentioned uh, blue-throated beetle, right? People, I know a lot of people are going to be like, huh, is that, that's not even such a rare bird in Singapore. But I think that's important. That That's precisely why monitoring them, then monitoring their breeding in particular is, is very important. We have the luxury of having enough birds now to be able to reasonably study them and get some sense of, like, where, where they go, preferred habitats and things like that. But in cases where populations drop below a certain level, right, it becomes incredibly difficult to study the birds. On one hand, you don't even want to disturb the birds because you're like, oh, no, any disturbance is going to bring, maybe they'll stop breeding or leave the site. You know, you don't have that, that, that level of comfort or, or, or certainty. And second of all, sometimes even locating the birds after they drop below a certain level can be challenging, right? So, like, off the top of my head, things like some of the forest babblers, right, yeah, yeah. those guys, in Singapore not doing as well and getting like doing like some ecological studies on them is, is difficult because the population density is so low yeah, yeah. you just can't catch or see enough these yeah. birds too. so yeah. studying birds before they get to that you know that, that threaten is important especially for birds that are occupying unique habitats or utilizing specific areas that other birds may not use. So things like blue-throated beetle and yeah. their sand bank yeah. type habitats because what they do is they actually burrow mm -hmm. into these banks of sand and they lay yeah. their eggs there Right, so this is not a very common habitat in Singapore. Yeah. You don't really see it in many, many places. And even though blue throated beetle is doing well now, we don't know what the future of these habitats are going to be. We don't know which. We need to know which months they're using these habitats for breeding. When do they disappear? You know, things like that. These are all important things to know so that we can prevent birds from becoming endangered. Because I think uh, in public consciousness, there's always a sense of like we only pay attention to something once it's threatened, right? But in many cases, once it's threatened, it's much harder to reverse that right but 
getting information about things before they become rare is also important precisely because it prevents us from, you know, spiraling down this, this, this rabbit hole of like, you know, like getting rarer and rarer and rarer. And then you having to like do like palliative care or like emergency, like, you know, like, like interventions to, to reverse this. Yeah. And also like, you know, when you said about the capture, recapture, like ringing birds, the, mm. the, it's important. It's like vitally important because we just don't know that much yeah, about a lot, lot many birds, many bird yeah. species. Like birds are some of the best studied animals in the world, but even birds in <laughs> yeah, Singapore, then, yeah. we in don't know Asia, that much. Yeah. 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 Like how much space, what's the territory of, yeah. of, you know, like a straw headed bulbul, which yeah, is like the conservation know, poster yeah, child yeah, at this yeah. point for, for birds in Singapore. We don't know that. Yeah. yeah. How long do they live in the wild? Like who eats them, how territorial they are. Like these things are all like things we don't really, really know. And in, in part, it's also because like these natural history studies have become so out of fashion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're not going to get into highest, uh, highest impact fashion <laughs> journals because of these yeah. studies, right? Yeah. Um, but they're vitally important. important. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Movin, you mentioned the straw hater boo as a like poster child. For, yes. Yes. Because yes. there was an action plan that was released last month. Yeah. I mean, December last so, month. Yeah. Straw headed bulbul. Um, what do we know about it? It is one of the sexiest bulbuls in the world. <laughs> it's the biggest bulbul in the Arches. world. Yes, you know, like um, red eyed, yellow headed, brown, golden body, streaked, um, wears black eyeliner, like <laughs> all of the the best things about birds, right? Um, and it has an absolutely beautiful call mm. and song. And in part, this is the problem, right? It's got a really nice song, and because of that, it's been like hunted to be kept in cages mm. throughout like the region so like actually singapore is the best place to see this bird you would have i have friends who are studying this bird and trying to do track them in kalimantan and stuff and you have to travel like 16 km from the nearest trail or road to even hear the birds and then the birds are still so shy mm-hmm. meanwhile here you literally see them over condo pools in coconut trees like just chilling in high heat yeah. and hopping around in parks yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have the, this striped species action plan and we cover a bunch of different topics within. So like, let's say we have monitoring ecology. So I think both Movin and I are involved in this group. And there's also uh, work into looking at the genetics and conservation breeding of these birds and also how to engage the community in raising more awareness for the species and also looking into the trade uh, yeah, of these yeah, yeah. Uh, striped bulbuls. So the great thing about Singapore is that we're really good at keeping baseline poaching really, really low. It's all thanks to Auntie Uncle in the park. If they see anyone, they will just complain and they will ask questions, right? And I mean this with, with the most love in my heart. I have it's, it's not even like a joke. Like the reason that we have so little poaching in Singapore is because people use these places, right? Mm. People use yeah. these parks. People go into these parks. And aunties and uncles, they are like the best because if they see something not right, right? They're nosy. <laughs> they will ask questions yeah. about it. They won't just like, oh, not my problem. They'll be like, ah, oh, what are you doing? Yeah. Catch, but I call, uh, and, and, but, you, you know what I mean? That, that, so so it's, it's hard to poach butts in Singapore. It's challenging. Yeah, and I guess Singapore has many of such species of birds whereby like they do really well here because they can adapt to the variety of habitats. Mm. And so you can kind of like spot them in higher higher frequency and numbers here in Singapore. So Singapore is a really interesting case study yeah. for the region because in many other cities, it's concrete and it's green. Yeah. There's no interface between yeah. the two, right? And so because of that, things that we generally think of in the region as forest species, things like hill miner, red-legged crick, do it yeah, instead. Really yeah, so like some of these birds, right? We do see them very close to human habitation or even within like the neighborhoods, you know? Like I walk 300 meters from my house to Ulam Panam Park Connect, I can see and hear Hill minor, and at night I can hear the hoo 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 of the of the red legged quick, you know, yeah, like yeah. in the evening. So oh, it's yeah. like, <laughs> so like these birds that are hard to see. I mean, so hill minor not so much hard to see, but red legged quick is yeah. like a prize it's difficult to spot yeah. throughout the range. Yeah, it's like range, a, yeah. it's like one of those like. People who bird watch in the region for years, yeah. but maybe don't live in Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. They come, they travel, maybe they've done like 10, 20 yeah. trips. They're missing red legged crane. Yeah, they actually come to Singapore yeah. to, 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 see this, <laughs> yeah. to see this birds. Because huh? you can actually spot them in like, like Putan Gardens. I've heard them calling outside my office yeah. and I just made a recording of it. They're just wandering yeah. around because they're used to people. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And maybe like hornbills, because yeah, when yeah. I'm like around the region, hornbills are like so far away from me. Mm. And here, our Oriental Pike hornbills just like under. Like Pastorist Park, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They're just, they're just and, big groups and, of them. And, and even in, in Pai like, you yeah. know, even in urban areas, yeah, yeah, yeah. the birds are just moving through yeah. and they're comfortable with people. And I think that's amazing about Singapore. That's that's that, that's really quite cool. 
And it, and it tells us really about the potential for the whole region, right? Mm. Like if more cities, newer cities, newer developments start doing more integrated things in this more mm. conscious way, the potential is really there. Yeah. So I think the other thing about straw-headed bubbles yeah. is that it's one of those birds you hear, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you hear, you know it's Call there. It's really yeah. distinctive. Yeah. yeah. So actually the song is, it's, it's, it's really interesting. The song is actually a duet of two mm. birds. So when you hear the full song, it's just it's a seamless cause. Like, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's just, it's actually two birds singing, but they are so in sync yeah. that it sounds like one call. It's a pair. Yeah. Like, so, and this is how they defend territory and yeah, yeah. reestablish their pair bond. And yeah, it's yeah. like super romantic and all of that <laughs> stuff, you know, but like, um, yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, acoustics monitoring, in particular, like linked link to stride bubbles, uh, it's really important for conservation planning, conservation research. Uh. So I think knowing more about the birds that are in the area and using uh, kind of like autonomous uh, sound detections of birds uh, which are very vocal. And so I think this can really help uh, mm. supplement or uh, some of our human surveys of uh, yeah. different habitats. Yeah. So I think, yeah. yeah, people can't be there all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> putting a device there to record background sounds and then having a, a software or yeah, like algorithm through, yeah, yeah. to process it. So you get really large volumes of data, a large volume of data and you can process it in an automated process without having to like manually look through and listen to all the calls, like hundreds of hours of calls. So I think that's, that's a really useful technology that we're trying to leverage right now. And yeah, so I think there's something we're working on with, uh, the MPARCS is working on with uh, NUS as well to develop this uh, acoustic monitoring system that can identify birds mm. just through their calls. Because uh, we, I think Movin mentioned before, the bird calls are really diagnostic. So you can actually pick out species just from their calls or their songs. We could talk a bit about like the diverse bird life in Singapore and like maybe you can share with us like the, the entire landscape of, of things here. All right, Dylan, drop the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah, Singapore is actually, a lot of people think we are such a small island. I think we really have quite a lot of species that can be found here in Singapore. So I think our species count in Singapore is currently at 428 species. So I think that's really high for such a small island. I yeah, mean, yeah, you have countries which are 10, 20 times bigger and maybe they only have like maybe 600 species. So I think Singapore is really a great place. Uh, and I think a lot of the diversity comes from migrants. So I think we, have, we get a lot of migrants in Singapore because I think Singapore is the kind of like the tip of the peninsula, the time early peninsula. So all the migrants kind of get funneled down the peninsula then gradually, then they finally stop at uh, Singapore, which is kind of the, the last stop before they have to cross this, yeah, to cross the sea uh, to, towards maybe Indonesia. So I think a lot of these uh, migrants or even rare vagrants actually uh, get uh, just stop over in Singapore and we, we see them. Uh. So I think we get species like, you know, back in 2021, we had like this influx of rare species in Singapore. Yeah, like yeah, we yeah. had uh, like tree pipit, spotted flycatcher. So these are stuff that the usually- The green brought yeah. Yeah, yeah, so th yeah. These are visitors from so, Malaysia. So, so yeah. it's interesting because Singapore, mm. like, uh, like I mean, Dylan said, like, migratory birds, a lot of them have, this, they don't really like flying over open water yeah. so much. So as far as possible, they just keep flying over land. Mm. So Singapore is the closest that you can get, right? But yeah, I think, and, and the interesting thing is like that year, 2021, mm. like Dylan, you said, we yeah. got some weird birds. These birds don't come to Singapore. They come to the region. Yeah. Um, weird weather patterns up north probably pushed like some individuals yeah. down south. La. So I think these are like some of these birds that have been seen in Singapore, like the migrants have not even been spotted. Uh, in, in Malaysia. Yeah, in Malaysia. Yeah, right. or yeah, in areas uh, surrounding air regions as well. Yeah, so, think, so kudos to the bird watching community in Singapore. Mm, like we yeah. have so many people here. The island is so densely bird watched, right? Like it's almost impossible for like these, these one, two individuals that are weird to like slip through. Yeah. And with that, we've come to the end of our episode. Thank you, Dylan and Movin, for joining us today. More information about our bird conservation efforts can be found on our website. If you're interested to go birding or connect with other birders in the community, do check out our citizen science programs like Garden Bird Watch and Heron Watch. More information is linked in our episode show notes. My name is Sarin and thank you so much for listening to That's Wow. If you've enjoyed this episode, do give us a follow and share your thoughts with us on Impact's socials. Stay tuned for more conversations to come. Bye! Bye.